Welcome back to our study of 2 Kings. We are in 2 Kings chapter 18 again, and we're picking it up in verse 13. We were introduced in the first part of the chapter to King Hezekiah. And in the second part of the chapter, we're going to learn about how the king of Assyria came and threatened Jerusalem and what that threat was like. And then in chapter 19, we're going to see how Hezekiah is going to respond to it. We'll come to that later, Lord willing. But for now, we want to see what the Assyrians do to threaten Jerusalem. Remember, the Assyrians are the ones who took Israel into exile. Because of their idolatry, uh, God sent his people, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, into exile. And he did that through the Assyrians. So will the Assyrians also take Judah into exile? They certainly seem to want to. But let's see what happens beginning in verse 13 of 2 Kings 18. It says, In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Now, it's important to note that this is about seven years after Assyria took Israel into exile. Uh, and Israel, or Assyria now has a different king. It's uh, Sennacherib now, uh, whereas before it was Shalmaneser. So a different king several years later, but now they are attacking the fortified cities of Judah and taking them. And so this is sort of the beginning of the threat against Jerusalem. Verse 14 says, And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. And the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorposts that Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. So Hezekiah's initial response to what the king of Assyria is doing is to try to uh, placate the king, as it were, right? To try to see if he can um, buy him off is maybe a, a more uh, crude way to put it, but that's essentially what he's doing, right? He's, he's trying to say, if I give you enough money, will you leave us alone? And so the king uh, tells him, this is how much money you need to send me. And it's a lot, right? So much so that um, Hezekiah ends up stripping the temple in order to send money uh, to the king of Assyria. And this, I think, foreshadows the destruction of the temple that's coming at the end of the book, right? So he, he strips the temple in order to have enough uh, to send to the king of Assyria to pay him. Right. And then um, picking it up, verse 17, it says, And the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rab Saris, and the Rab Shakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. When they arrived, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway to the washer's field. And when they called for the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary and Joah, the son of Asaf, the recorder. So the king of Assyria seems to be sending some of his uh, representatives, some of his high officials, uh, to speak to King Hezekiah, but Hezekiah doesn't meet with them himself. Instead, he sends some of his officials right, to meet with them. Uh, and it's significant, right, that they have come with a large army. Verse 17 says, a great army. So it's not just sort of three delegates come to have a meeting, but they've come with an army representing the power of the king of Assyria and, and ultimately representing uh, a threat to the city of Jerusalem. So um, here comes this retinue with an army behind them, and here's what they say. Verse 19, it says, And the Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, on what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? 
Behold, you are trusting now in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. How can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Okay, so what is going on here? Well, first of all, uh, they are asking Hezekiah, who are you trusting? Who do you think is going to help you and deliver you from me? They talk about Hezekiah rebelling against uh, the king of Assyria. So there's some, you know, it sounds like new hostility here. Uh, perhaps they don't like something Hezekiah has done. And so uh, what does Hezekiah think he can do? Or who does Hezekiah think is going to be able to help him if the king of Assyria decides to punish him, right? To come against him in force uh, in consequence of his rebellion. He says, you can't just use words. You can't talk yourself out of war. So who are you trusting in? Are you trusting in Egypt? Right, so he mentions in verse 21, uh, you are now trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff. So you're, you're trusting Egypt to deliver you. You're trusting Egypt to rescue you. That's not gonna work. He even says in verse 22, if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed? Now, this is interesting, right? Because he says, okay, if you say, well, we're trusting in our God to deliver us, they say, well, didn't you just get rid of a bunch of altars where people were worshiping that God? Now, we know those altars were unauthorized at best and idolatrous at worst. They're supposed to be worshiping God in Jerusalem. Hezekiah was doing the right thing in removing those altars, right? But they're saying, look, you've removed all these altars. Are you really in a great position even with God in order to trust in him? Seems to be what they are saying or implying, right? So they misunderstand the situation, but they're still trying to undermine uh, their faith in God, their trust that the Lord will deliver them. He goes on to talk about the situation that Judah is in, that Jerusalem is in, when he says, in effect, I, I, would, I would give you 2,000 horses if you could put riders on them. And since you can't, how can you even hope to square off against the smallest part of my army? You don't stand a chance. You don't have anywhere near the military might necessary to respond to my army, to my power, to my might, the king of Assyria is saying. Then they claim in verse 25 that it's actually God who told them to do this. Right? He says, the Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. We're here on God's authorization. Now, I don't think that's true. I don't think there's any clear indication that that's true. God did use Assyria to take Israel into exile, but there's no indication, I don't think, that God intended for Assyria to take Judah into exile or for Assyria to conquer Jerusalem. I may be missing something somewhere in the Bible. So if I miss something you know of, please point it out to me. But I, I don't think there's any indication of this. In, instead, here's what we do find out about God's plan and God's intention with Assyria from the book of Isaiah. This is from Isaiah chapter 10. It says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation I send him, and against the people of my wrath I command him, to take spoil and seize plunder, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. But he does not so intend, and his heart does not so think, but it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. For he says, Are not my commanders all kings? Is not Calno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? 
As my hand has reached to the kingdoms of the idols whose carved images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her idols as I have done to Samaria and her images? When the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes. Okay, so here's what we've got so far from Isaiah chapter 10. God is using Assyria as his instrument. They are his rod, right? They are his staff. He is executing his uh, anger, his judgment, uh, his punishment upon Israel through Assyria. And Jerusalem uh, comes into play here as well, right? but it's not clear to what degree. And it says that the king of Assyria is not intending to do the Lord's will. right? So even if this approach to Jerusalem carried out uh, by the, the representatives of the king of Samaria, even if this is part of God's plan, It does not appear to be part of God's plan to send Assyria to destroy Jerusalem, which is not going to happen. That's going to be Babylon. It may be part of God's plan to use Assyria to test Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem. That seems to be uh, what is happening, right? Um, But not God sent me here to destroy you, overcome you, like the king of Assyria seems to be claiming, right? Go up against this land and destroy it, is what he said the Lord told him to do. That does not seem to be the case at all. Now, that was the case for uh, Samaria, right, for Israel, but I'm not sure that God told him that. It sounds like he doesn't know that, the king of Assyria, based on what Isaiah is saying. The king of Assyria is just doing what he wants to do, which is conquer people, right? So. Isaiah goes on and he says um, that eventually he's going to punish Assyria for Assyria's boastfulness. For he says, by the, and this is about, the, about Assyria, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I have understanding. I remove the boundaries of peoples and plunder their treasures. Like a bull, I bring down those who sit on thrones. My hand has found like a nest the wealth of the peoples, and as one gathers eggs that have been forsaken, so I have gathered all the earth, and there was none that moved a wing or opened the mouth or chirped. So the king of Assyria is boasting, look at what I can do. Look at what I'm accomplishing. Look at how strong I am. But here's what God says. Shall the axe boast over him who hews with it, or the saw magnify itself against him who wields it? As if a rod should wield him who lifts it, or as if a staff should lift him who is not wood. Therefore, the Lord God of hosts will send wasting sickness among his stout warriors, and under his glory a burning will be kindled like the burning of fire. The light of Israel will become a fire, and his holy one a flame, and it will burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. The glory of his forest and of his fruitful land the Lord will destroy both soul and body. And it will be as when a sick man wastes away. The remnant of the trees of his forest will be so few that a child can write them down. So God says that Assyria is like an axe in his hand. And just like an axe shouldn't boast over the person who hews it as though it's the axe doing the work and not the man. So it is God who is using Assyria as an instrument of judgment against uh, Samaria, right, against Israel. Uh, but he's not going to destroy Jerusalem. And uh, God is going to punish Assyria as well because of Assyria's boastfulness. All right? So that's what's going on here. Now, let's keep going back in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 26. It says, Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Did not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rav Shakeh said to them, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you, and not to the men sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and to drink their own urine? Okay, pretty graphic, right? Here's what's going on. The representatives of King Hezekiah, they don't want everybody in the town hearing these threats. So they want to use a language that they will understand, Aramaic, but that the people of the town won't all understand. 
but the representatives of the king of Assyria refuse. They want everyone to hear, right? Because they want everyone to be afraid. They want everyone to cower as a result of their threat so that they'll just give up. They're threatening, it sounds like here, a siege, right? Well, people will be thirsty and starving uh, and result, have to result to terrible, drastic measures just to stay alive. And so they're basically saying, you don't want that to happen, right? So you should just give in. Well, they're not going to give in. But here's what happens next. Verse 28 says, Then the rapture case stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah. So he wants all the people in Jerusalem to hear this. Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, the Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one of his own fig tree, and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the kings of Assyria, or excuse me, king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hina, and Iva? Where, or excuse me, have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their lands out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Okay, lots going on here. Uh, what is he saying? Well, again, he's telling them, uh, don't trust in God, right? God cannot deliver you from me. Don't trust Hezekiah and don't let Hezekiah tell you to trust the Lord. It's not going to work. Instead, he says, you should trust me. Now, if nothing else has been clear up to this point, this ought to be really clear to any Jew who understands the Bible, who's living in Jerusalem at that time, who knows their history, knows what God has done, knows what God has expected of them. If Hezekiah was the one saying, don't trust God, trust me, they should know that's a bad plan. If the king of Assyria says, don't trust your king who's telling you to trust God, instead trust me, they should know that's a bad plan. Anytime anyone says, trust this person or this thing other than God, don't listen to them. The Bible is very clear about that. Don't trust in horses and chariots. Don't trust in princes. Don't put your trust in men. Your trust should be in the Lord God. So the king of Assyria is on the wrong side here. If there was any question about up to this point, they should not be listening to him. He is playing the role of the deceiver. He's saying the kinds of things that Satan would say. He's got, uh, and, this, and the representatives of the king of Assyria, rather, they've got um, powerful rhetoric on their side. They are clever communicators. But at the bottom of what they're saying, they're calling for them to trust the king of Assyria rather than, rather than to trust God. And that is always wrong always a bad plan. That's always a temptation to sin. That is never an invitation to walk the path of wisdom. The path of wisdom is always trusting God and not putting your ultimate trust in anybody else. Also notice what the king of Assyria promises. Right? He says, if you just trust me, if you just listen to me, you get to stay and eat and be comfortable at your house and you're going to live and oh, by the way, I'll let you do that until I decide it's time for you to move. And then when I move you somewhere else, it'll be a place just like home. It won't be home, right? But it'll be just like home. Uh, in other words, you're not going to be free. You're not even going to get to decide what country you live in. But at least I'm going to let you live. Not really a great deal, right? But he wants them to think their options are trust me and live where I tell you to live or die. Those are your options. That's what he is communicating. But there's a third option, right? Trust God and trust God to deliver you from the king of Assyria. And they have good reason 
to believe that God will deliver them because of what the king of Assyria goes on to say, right? In verse 32, he says, do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, the Lord will deliver us. And then he goes on to explain why he thinks that's misleading. And he talks about other lands, other gods that he's conquered. And he says, look, their gods couldn't deliver them. What makes you think your God can deliver you? Now, that is exactly the kind of situation where the Bible teaches us to expect that God will deliver his people. Because what is one of the things that God is clearly, consistently communicating all throughout Scripture, especially trying to you know, sort of pound this into people's minds and hearts in the Old Testament? He's trying to show them, right, so that they will understand and believe that he is the only true God, that the gods of the nations are not real gods, that they are idols, that they are false, that they are not trustworthy, uh, that even behind those are demons, the Bible says. So they are not real gods. They are not trustworthy. There's only one real God. So when a powerful king with a huge army that God's people can't possibly defeat or rescue themselves from says, we've conquered a bunch of other people and their gods couldn't save them, what makes you think your God can save you? That's exactly the kind of situation where God loves to step in and say, let me show you that I'm not like those other gods. These, it's not that these people are different from any other nation other than they're mine and I'm the real God and no one can thwart my purpose like Job talks about in Job 42. So um, the king of Assyria thinks that the God of Israel is just like all the other gods that the nations worship. But he's wrong. The God of Israel is the God who created the heavens and the earth. He's the God over all. He's the one true and living God, and there is none like him. And he is going to deliver his people, as we'll see, Lord willing, in chapter 19. We'll let's wrap this up with the last couple of verses, verse 36 and 37. But the people were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rav Shekeh. So um, what can we say about this at the end? Right? They don't respond. They don't threaten in return. In that sense, uh, their response here uh, anticipates how Jesus will respond Right when, when he's being... Um, mocked and crucified and and Pilate says you know why don't you answer me don't you know I have the authority to crucify you uh, and in that case Jesus responds and says you wouldn't have any authority to crucify me unless it was given you from above people mock him while he's hanging on the cross if you're the son of God why don't you save yourself but he doesn't mock them back he doesn't revile in return Peter talks about how uh, he didn't do those things he didn't uh, curse those who were cursing him. And uh, in the same way here, these men don't, they don't revile uh, the messengers from the king of Assyria, but they are grieved by what, uh, by the threat that has been brought against them. That's why, uh, or they're in distress or something. That's why they tear their clothes and uh, they are going to bring uh, this uh, report to Hezekiah and Hezekiah is going to have a similar response. But what we know from the Bible uh, already, right before we get to this point, is that it's not the largest army that wins. Like God made that point very clear in the days of the judges through Gideon. Remember when he had him reduce his army, made it smaller and smaller, and so that it would be clear when they defeated their enemies that it was not because they were strong or mighty or whatever, but it was because God had rescued them God had delivered them. So um, we're going to stop there for this time. It's kind of in the middle of the story. Uh, I hope you want to know what happens next. And so Lord willing, we will get in our next session into chapter 19 and at least begin to see how Hezekiah responds, how the prophet Isaiah responds, and what's going to happen with this arrogant king who's threatening the Lord's people in Jerusalem. Until then, God bless.